is the last time I was here was back in December and I did the 50th anniversary lecture for Apollo 17, the last mission to the moon. There's a link from that lecture to this one, and it's that picture. It's known as the Blue Marble, which is weird, obviously. That was taken by the crew of Apollo 17 on the way to the moon, and you are 70,000 miles away from the Earth. Now, being a made schoolboy error, and I've forgotten the laser pointer, I have to do this little fashion way. There's Antarctica, Madagascar, Africa, North Africa, Saudi Arabia, Europe, so we let it somewhere. <coughs> so, as you might suggest, this is all about the Earth. Now, this is a bit of a departure for me. Usually, I'm off talking astronomy, space flight, physics, like Milwaukee, or people who are Captain Kirk and all that. Well, not so much Captain Kirk. This one, this is the first lecture I've ever generated that's sent me absolutely whappy. Because I've gone, hang on a minute, and I mean, it's not straightforward, like goes to the moon, like launch, and then fly off the moon, and samples off and away, go you know, and fetch This one covers 4.5 billion years of Earth history, and I've got two hours. <laughs> See me sweating? Um, this has come out, and this, this is my suggestion, complete massive, ma massive so What are we doing? What's, what, what's your thing? Oh, well, nature, mate. It's a bit vague, isn't it? So, so. All right, well, back to the lecture about the Earth. I've done geology at university. I've done environmental studies. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, I like that one. Okay, fine. Oh, pain the last words. I did my geology degree, well, geology branch of science degree, at University of Derby, nearly a quarter of a century ago. I'm not a field geologist, unfortunately. Um, so coming to do this, I felt like a first year undergrad uh, again. Ignore the pet rocks on there, because that's come from various sources and various geological trips of mine. Even though I've got them, I'm not a field geologist. Far from it. Um, I'm more of an astronomer. So I thought, okay, fine. I've, so I've gone back to my first year geology with this. And I've realised just how far things have moved on in 25 years, as you'll see in a minute. Things I thought that were setting, no, setting stone. Oh, many of them. It's changed completely. New research, new observations, new experiments, new ways of things. I've gone. I'm going to put this in a talk now. So it's like I'm relearning everything. Another emphasis for this is this gentleman. One of my scientific heroes. Um, anyone old enough to remember his series Cosmos back in the 80s? <coughs> anyone see them? You can't get any better. Oh, <laughs> so I'm not sure. You can't get any better for science programs. If I could present, present it, well, tell me afterwards. If I could present a lecture half as well as he can, or even 1% as well, or like 1% as well as he can, of course, I'd die a happy man. He was on the Voyager uh, spacecraft, uh, not literally, um, one of the scientists. And at the end of the mission, Sagan went, right, where are they up? Three odd billion, I guess it was what, about 300 billion miles away from the Earth. Shall we turn the spacecraft back to take a family portrait of the solar system? NASA went, why? Because it'd be cool. Yeah, there's no scientific merit for it. We don't know all the science. We're going to turn the cameras off to save power. Yeah, but the public on the surface. back and forth, back and forth, saving one the day. So, do I 
don't do what you want. Right, like, we got a new job. Turn around, object the picture. So they move the scan platform around and start just snapping away. <coughs> this, is, this is what the game known as family portrait. Earth, Sun, Earth, Venus, Jupiter. The glare of the Sun's quite bad. Mars, that's the other side of the Sun, I think. Saturn, Neptune, Uranus. And do not Pluto. Pluto's over here somewhere. Well, okay, fine. These are the actual pictures. There is Venus and the Earth. The sun's blocked out. There's the Earth. From three billion miles away. It's a dot. A speck. You've just seen it from 70,000 miles away. It's huge. When you get this far out, it ain't nothing. It's just another speck amongst millions of other specks. You are here. You live, you live on that pixel. That's less than a pixel. And I went, blimey. Press conference. So you did that, man. <gasps> Look at this. Public went crackers. Published a book, Hell Blue Dot. If you get a chance to read it, you can get it. There's a passage in there, he said at the press conference, and I'll play you, which sort of puts the earth into perspective, and does. Uh, if I can get this to look. Oh, that one. No. Drop it. Yeah, you say. Come on. There we go. That's fine, give me some. scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our postures, our imagined self-importance, the delusion we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lone speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that 
that hope will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. <laughs> it has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, <coughs> it underscores our responsibility to be more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only one we've ever known. Things in, sort of puts things into perspective a little bit. But not only are we isolated by distance, we're also isolated by time. I'm going to take you back 4.5 billion years. It's going to be a bumpy ride. For the first two and, a half, two and a half billion years, not a great deal happened. Unless you are looking at bacteria. But from about 500 billion years onwards, it gets interesting. Uh, I might have one of the two things said about people who uh, did Jurassic Park, but let's not go there. <laughs> this is the history of the Earth. It's deep time. It starts off here, 1.6 billion years ago. Go around, that's the Hadean. Formation of the Earth, formation of the Moon, there's the Archean. Not a great deal going on there. Get the approaches over it. Oh, sign of bacteria. Another two million years. And you get to about there, beginning of the period of it, that's when things go up. So for the first bit of this talk, you want to go, what's going on? There's nothing going on. These are the remaining eons of Earth history. The Hidean from 4.5 billion to 4 billion. The Archean. 4 billion to 2.5 billion. The Proterozoic, 2.5 billion to 538 million. The Phanerozoic, which we're in now, 538 uh, million years ago to the present. That's when we get complex life, vertebrates, humans, the whole kit kaboom. But the first two, not a great deal going on. So you've got eons, go from 500 billion to a billion years. Here is 50 million to 450, yeah, 450 billion years to 50 million years. Periods, 40 million years to 10 million years. I've got this backwards. Epochs, 5 million years to 2 million years. And the smallest ones, ages, 2 million years to 100,000 years. We currently fall in that. We've been Homo sapiens, modern humans, for mm, about two and a half, no, two hundred thousand years. We're the new kids on the block. We're right at the bottom of that time call. Mm -hmm. To put it <coughs> graphically, that's it. The er earliest fossils at Cambrian. It's one or two years from Proteus Earth, but we're talking science. And that's all the bus that there's one or two extinctions along the way. I'm going to go Hadean, Archean, Protozoic, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Sanzoic. I'm not going to do any of these. We will be here all night. <laughs> so I'll just do the big years and tell you what happened collectively. So to go through this, we've got to go through astronomy, geology, chemistry, biology, and climatology. So it's physics, astrophysics, geochemistry, geophysics, glaciology, paleontology. You can see why I was getting a headache with this. <laughs> so, we start out with the formation of the solar system about 500 billion years ago. There was a huge cloud, cloud of gas and dust, a molecular cloud. Probably a nebula, remnants from a previous formation of previous star, just sitting there doing nothing, and then one day, supernova goes off somewhere else, shockwave comes in, this 
disturb the nebula and it starts to contract. Now, how do you know that? Well, we don't, to be quite honest. That's the leading theory as to how all this material start to uh, condense to form the solid nebula that we took the on to form the sun and the planets. We don't know for sure. Where's your guessing? Pure guess. But there is evidence for it that it's finding it. These three gentlemen, Emmanuel Swedberg, Emmanuel Kant, and Pierre Simon Lavasse, they suggested the solar nebula idea. Um, they've got a bit of stick, they've got a bit of stick for it. So well, it goes against the Bible. Yeah, there's always been it. It didn't fall from the sun with bottom of it. So it came up with a solid nebula idea. Swedberg and Kant were both philosophers. The only astronomer was Laplace. You'll think I'll gravitate more to Laplace than the others. Nobody will. That's basically what we're looking at as a data. This is the Orion Nebula in the Orion constellation. It's the bit. The Ryan's belt, those three stars in a row, that's just below. It's a bit faint patch of light. That's it. And in there, in the trapezium area, oh, I've got the plan so that's the collapse. That's a dark cloud from the core, and that starts there. That's 200 AU wide. Now, AU is an astronomical unit, 93 million miles. Huge expansion space. It starts to collapse. It forms a disk, and this forms between 10,000 and 100,000 years. So the central mass is going to become a star. There's your protoplanetary disk, and there's a central star. At this point, it starts collapsing, bringing all the material together, so the core is getting hotter. And it's starting to spin. A bit like an ice skater who draws his hands in, he spins all, spins all past it. Conservation of angular momentum, probably pedantic about it. So it spins up. The core gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And by that time, it switches on. It becomes a, becomes a t, t toroid star at this stage. Nuclear fusion begins in, in the star's core and it switches on. By this time, planets are starting to form. Again, all the material can creep in after that. There's your central star, there's your planetary system. That's about after 50 million years. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a bit of time. Okay, fine, but it does happen. Hubble Space Telescope took these pictures of the uh, Nebula Orion in 42. These are known as propylids. Basically, um, dust and gas areas where a solar system is forming. And in this one, you can see a central star. There's a dust disk. There's a central star. I really wish I had. Um, it's old school then, it's old school. This is a microwave, uh, sort of millimeter, radio image, of HL Tauri in the constellation of Taurus. That's a solar system in formation. And you can see all the areas <coughs> and the materials are swept out by the forming planets, and there's a central star. So Laplace and his mates were right. And now we've got direct evidence that it actually happens. <coughs> There's your protostar, what's known as the soot line. Anything that's closer to, you get all your heavier elements. Because the latter elements are drawn off. You get hydrogen, your helium, whatever else, that's drawn off. That goes past the frost line. So your outer planets form then, all your comets, and all your terrestrial planets form as well. But recently, our old friend Jupiter 
formed in here. Hmm? Why? Because. And it started to fall into the sun. But Saturn was forming here. As Jupiter was coming in, it took all the material. Poor old Mars was around here somewhere. Didn't have much to eat, basically. Jupiter ate all the pies. In effect. That's why Jupiter's ended to Mars in half the size of the Earth. Jupiter took all the, all the material. Saturn came along, that was forming there, and its gravitational um, effect suddenly so it's like a ship tacking into the wind. It pulled Jupiter out to the outer solar system. Caused a bit of gravitational shenanigans, but Jupiter didn't start in the outer solar system. That's a T-Tauri stage. That's a star switching off. <coughs> Thermonuclear reactions begin. That is the inside of one of these things. Meteorite. And they're called chondrules. They are the earliest uh, materials to form in the solar system. They're like little mineral rays. They were formed in the hot interior of the solar system. This rock is 4.5 billion years old. It's the oldest rock we'll hold on that table. Well, apart from the beach, right? But the, the, the terrestrial rock. So once the chondrules formed in the pentaplanetary disk, the planet started to change. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Formed asteroids, planet planetary and the testimonies, and then started slamming into protoplanets. Now, a colleague at work asked me a question. Hey, Ann, a few ago, says, uh, why are planets round? Um, well, okay. Um, you know much about gravity? Um, well, you usually get your standing up. Sound against gravity. <coughs> well, you know, it's full of. You get all this material coming in. You get to a certain size, I think it's 300 miles in diameter. Gravity goes, right, I'm going to fall you into a sphere because everything's falling inwards at the same rate and the same level. So you go from an irregular object looking like you're going to turn around with Mike Tyson to a cue hole. You get bigger. That's why asteroids look like potatoes and planets look like cubes. You get to a certain diameter, you'll form a sphere. And you do it by doing that. Planetary, planetary construction. You just smash rocks together. And that's how the Earth formed. And as it got bigger, it pulled in more material. And it began to what's known as differentiate. All the, there's metal in these asteroids. In fact, after that, you can have a look at this, but that's a nickel iron meteorite. That's all metal. The metal, well, that's in its molten state, sinks to the core of the protoplanet, and the rocky material, a bit like slag on top of the furnace, rises to the top. See the differentiated body. That's the half formed Earth. Artistic license, and it's not <laughs> That's what you think. So, how do we get the moon? Why is it all this is going on? How do we get the moon? Did it fall from all this stuff formed here? Did it spin off from the Earth? Did it come from somewhere else? When the Apollo astronauts landed on the moon, got the samples back and they were analysed back on Earth, they found out there wasn't much in the way of hydrated minerals on the moon, i.e. water-bearing minerals. We have found water on the moon since, but there's no water-bearing mineral, which means the, uh, the moon was exceedingly dry. Also, it's not got much of a magnetic field, so therefore it hasn't got much of an iron core. Hmm, interesting. It's chemically similar, but not identical to the Earth. It hasn't got much in the way of metal. What's going on? 
So, someone had an idea. About 4.2 billion years ago, 24 billion years ago, a protoplanet the size of Mars went, oh, hello, Earth. Come on, shake hands. Bam. A glancing blow. Threw material out. The planet was pink. The Mars-sized world was, was since been called Theta. That's completely, completely disrupted. Its core then uh, fused onto the Earth with the Earth's core, and the Earth's core got bigger. It threw material out. I mean, it remounted the Earth completely. It threw material out. Things that it mm, could say it formed like a ring system, sort of, but there were two blocks. The bigger block, on the bottom of the Earth, sank back in and collided with the Earth. The smaller block swept up the other bits of material left over, and that became that object over there, a few billion years ago. So that explains why it's sort of chemically similar, but not. It hasn't got much metal, because the Earth needs it. That's how, that's how the moon looks today. Although, it looks a little bit different, and I'll come on to that later on in the story. But when the Earth, but when the moon formed, it was a lot closer. I mean, a lot closer. It's moving away from us about, about one centimetre a year. And uh, the Apollo astronauts put um, laser reflectors on the surface. You fire a laser at it, and you can work out the travel times. I think it takes 1.3 seconds for a light bulb to get to the Earth, and the moon can work out the distance. You can fire it often enough, you'll go, oh, the moon's moving away. Ah, quite fair enough. Three and a billion years ago, four and a billion year, years ago, the moon was a lot closer. At the moment, it's 240,000 miles away, on average. It was a lot closer. And there's a view by our old friend Voyager 1 as it left the outer planet in 1977. Now, I'm going to talk about the Earth as it is now. And I'll motor on through because we've got, we've got bacteria and dinosaurs to go. Um, this is the Earth as it is now. This is our home. 93 million miles. I've got kilometers there, but I won't read them both out for the same time, so I'll just do my ones. 93 million miles on average, in an astronomical unit. Perihelion, closest point to the sun, 91,402 miles. That's on the 3rd of January. So you're closer to the sun in winter than you are in summer. Yay! Um, Perihelion, furthest point in its orbit. 94,500 uh, miles on average, 4th of July. You're further away from the sun in the summer. Doesn't seem fair. So you've, got, you've got the tilt of the Earth to take into account. Orbital period, 365 days. At the moment, the Earth's got a 24 hour day. It didn't always have a Back when uh, Mr. Moon was made, the Earth's rotation was a lot faster. The Earth's day could have been about 10 hours. The Earth slowed up in the intervening 4 billion years. So we've got 365 days going around the sun based on 24 hour rotation one day. Probably have more days per year because we were, because we were ro rotating on our axis. axis. At the moment, that's what we've got. It's barreling around the sun at 66,622 miles per hour. You think you're sitting still? No, you're travelling at 66,000 miles an hour. Where's your seatbelt? Mm. Axial tilt, 23 degrees. That's what gives us our seasons. As you go around, um, the northern hemisphere has its summer. 
the budget for money you will get. I mean, they normally uh, tilt moves away, the north has its winter, and the south has its summer. Surface gravity, 1G, 32 feet per second. Fair enough, that just tells you how much force is acting. To escape the Earth completely, you're going to be moving at 25,000 miles an hour, 7 miles a second. You need a satin fire for that. Now you have to be surface temperatures. Uh, the minimum, the 89.2 degrees Celsius, I think that was in Antarctica, I think. Atmospheric uh, composition by volume. Nitrogen, 78%, oxygen, 20.9%, water, water, 0. Point blah, 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 blah. Less than one percent argon, even less carbon dioxide. I see some amazed faces now. Um, even less neon, less helium, far less methane, even though methane is the worst part of the greenhouse gas. Krypton and hydrogen. Now, we've only got that tiny sliver of hydrogen because the Earth hasn't got enough gravity to hold on to hydrogen. hydrogen just escapes the space as soon as we get a chance. Because we haven't got the gravitational field, unlike Jupiter, to hold on to, our, to, to the appreciable hydrogen and we can't do it. We can get it when we crack the water into oxygen and hydrogen. That's a different matter. That's, that's the structure of the Earth. That's where you live. If you think about the rind of an orange, that's the orange zest. That's where you live. The rest, mm. you got the mantle, which is semi-liquid. It's pretty much a solid. The outer core and the inner core. The inner, the outer core is liquid, and that spins, and that's what gives the Earth its magnetic field. And there's the inner core, which is solid. Think about the a little bit smaller than Mars, I think, collectively. That's it with the distances. You've got a continental cross where we reside, upper mantle, the Cenosphere, and the Athenosphere. That goes down to about 2,900 kilometres, and you've got the outer core from that to 500, sorry, 5,100 kilometres. Then the inner core down to the centre of the Earth, 6,378 kilometres. It's a long way down. Don't want to go there, but it's a long way down to the centre of the Earth. Now, this is one of the bits that gave me my first bit of pulling my hair out. I'm very careful. Look at the structure of the Earth, and I'm doing the background reading, and then I want to do this piece of research. These, there's another one for the sun. This is continental Africa. This is what's known as a mantle bar. There's another one, opposite side, under the Pacific. It's a huge structure within the mantle. And it's moving upwards about a centimetre a year. That's moving up through the mantle. So it's not smooth layers and all homogeneous, there's peaks and troughs and blocks all over the place. Where's it coming from? Oh, like I said, there's two of them. There's the one Africa, and there's the one in the Pacific. So you can tell you, oh, what are they? How can, how can you count them? It should be homogeneous all the way. It isn't. Well, why is it so lumpy? Someone's come up with a theory. Um, how they're going to prove it's beyond me. But some observers have suggested what you're looking at are the remains of Thea, the object that slammed into the Earth four billion years ago, and 
and is now the rocky bit of it to form part of our mantle, where the metal sunk down to the core. That could be the remains of Theo. How do we prove it? Don't know. Shape of the earth. Any flat earth people in the audience? <laughs> if not, you know where the door is. Um, that's the earth, and that's the topographical representation. These are earth and heights. You've got low line areas there, high areas of earth. These are your spreading centers, where the crust is extending out. So, yeah, we know the earth. Of course we do. Yeah, but how did we know? Well, I'll let, I'll let my old friend Carl Sagan go. You might notice I'll, I'll lean quite heavily on Dr. Sagan. Okay. Alexandria, 800 kilometers to the north, we cast 
Decent change. So, we've known the years been round for quite some time. So, any flat earthers? You know what there's always? Um, so, I'm trying to put two bits into one here. I'm now going to look at the Earth's orbit and how changes in the Earth's orbit in relation to its travels around the sun and how it rotates can also affect climate. Milankovitch cycles. Aha! Then you'll know where I'm going with this one. Um, there's a fellow, um, was he Czech or something? Uh, I think he was Serbian. A fellow by the name of Milutin Milankovitch. He did some calculations and he thought, oh well, the Earth does some strange things when it comes around the sun. And there's cycles, and those cycles, as the Earth goes around the Sun over time, changes the angle of the Earth towards the Sun, which changes how solar radiation hits the Sun surface. So the first one is the shape of the Earth's orbit. Now, in some books you'll see it's a circle. It ain't. This is exaggerated, but the Earth's orbit is very slightly, slightly difficult with the Sun at one place. That changes over time, over thousand, over thousand, hundred thousand year cycles. Because, believe it or believe it not, Jupiter and Saturn are tugging at us. Oi, Earth, get over here. <laughs> We're getting bullied. <clears throat> Another thing, now, Mercury does a similar thing, and you have to take Einstein to work that out. The Earth's orbit around the Sun shapes. When you think you're going back to your starting point, oh no you're not. 
this orbit is not stable, it drifts, again through gravitational per per perturbation. And that's a 112 year, 112,000 year cycle. The Earth's tilt changes every 41,000 years. At the moment, we're at 23.5 degrees, but it can go from 24.5 to 22.1 over that 48,000 year period. So that changes, obviously that changes, because it, it's, it's a 23 degree tilt that uses our seasons. That's going to make it a, it'll make it a question. And another, another one, the yeah, spinning. Oh, it's so spinning. It's wobbling, like a, not a spinning top, as it gets closer to, as it slows down, it, its head starts doing this. That's what the poles of the Earth are doing. At the moment, our north pole is pointing at the pole star, Polaris. In 13,000 years, we will move round. And off the top, I, mean, I can't remember what star it is that comes after Polaris. No. But every, another 26,000 years, it will be Polaris again. And that's Polaris. Just for completeness. So all these have an effect. But just recently, they found another cycle. Oops. Oh, no, I missed it. It was 70,000 years. And again, it has to do with the shape of the Earth's orbit. So the Earth doesn't play by the rules. When you think, oh, it goes in a circle every year, blah, 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 it's quite happy what it's doing. No, it goes its own way. Oh, it is influenced by Jupiter and Saturn every so often and gets pulled up in the straight and narrow. But it's not set in stone. These are the tectonic plates of the Earth. Basically, if you imagine the surface of, of an egg you've cracked after you boil it. These are the plates that the continents ride on. And it gives us a bit of a problem. These give us volcanoes and our old friend earthquakes. Um, we're not too bad because we're here. Only the Eurasian plate, no end of the plate boundary, we're fine. Iceland, which is about that there, right across the plate boundary. And it's a diversion boundary, it's pulling apart. This is what pulls the plates around, and it's the mantle. There's convection currents. It's a bit like, I'm not saying you do this because it's, it's dangerous, but if you get some oil put in the chip pan and heat it up, and you look over the pan, don't do this. <laughs> you look at the bottom of the pan and you'll see little convection cells going up. Hot material comes up, cools off, slides down. That's the convection cell. <coughs> exactly what's happening in the mantle. There's two competing theories. One's shallow and there's two areas separate by, by a transition level. Latest thinking is, no, it's, deep, it's, a, it's a deep sign. But these convection currents move the Earth's plates around. And it needs also a way for the Earth to lose its interior heat. Because it's pretty hot down there. You're talking three, four thousand degrees, roughly. And that's due to a the core still cooling off from the formation of the Earth. But also it's chock full of uranium and thorium, which are radioactive elements. So as radioactive elements decay, they give off heat. So it's raining that heat out through the rock. That's why the deeper you go, it tends to get hotter. If, if you go down a deep mine, like a salt mine or a coal mine, you're, you're just sweating all the time. That's basically it. And as the crust gets, in some areas, subducted, i.e. pushed down, it melts. And as it melts, it rises back up again. <coughs> 
not as that, but as a uh, melted continental crust. And that comes up through volcanoes. Basically that. Then the ocean trend trend disappeared. That's a spreading centre. That's where the uh, crust being pulled apart. Yeah, that is in Iceland, a bridge between continents. Uh, of the year with Bali. I'm not very good at Icelandic names, I do apologize. Um, I've been there, he says, maybe not there. That's the rift. Obviously, there's the bridge. You approach the bridge. Here are my questions. You know, information. You say, yeah. You are now going to travel from one tectonic plate to the other. Enjoy your trip. Now, when I went, it was January. Minus 15, got cold, ice all over the place. Built on the bridge, old skating rink. <laughs> oh, walking boots, please don't fail me now. So off I went. You go across, and you're presented, before you get to the bridge proper, information sign saying, you are currently standing on the Eurasian tectonic plate. Yay. Right, go, go across the bridge. I stopped halfway because I couldn't, I mean, all right, for me being the geek and the majority geek I am, that, and that's, <sighs> you know, that, that's a pretty picture. But I've got to take a picture of the actual bit. You go across, congratulations, you are now standing on the North American tectonic plate. Mm -hmm. So you walk from one tectonic plate to another in about 30 odd seconds. Well, apart from a couple of slips, I'm going to be honest. This is a conservative plate boundary, i.e., it's what's known as strike slip fault. Two tectonic plates are sliding against it. These are the ones that really give you a problem with the earthquakes. And these are the plates are moving. So that's Hawaii there. And Hawaii being moved out there. That's heat transport. Solar radiation heats the oceans, salinity, um, the density of the water by changing it to heat the currents. But because the continents get in the way, they form these cells. And the one we've got to keep an eye on is the North Stream. Because that goes in what's known as the Atlantic Conveyor, and that's what gives us our temperate climate. If that shuts down, we've got problems. Again, there's, there's a good representation of the Atlantic Convey. Cold water goes down. As it goes down, it's dragging the hot water from the surface around and up. And it's getting further up, to, up the water column, which is cooling off and going down, which is pulling more water, the warm water from the southern oceans, up to the north. It's a very efficient system, and it's based on water salinity. I think the the more mineral salts in the water, it's denser, so therefore the temperature gradient changes. This is the ocean. Bits of it and lakes. Um, that's the Titanic when it used to be a ship. That's the Titanic now it's a wreck. I'm not going to say anything more because there's another wreck there. That's about two miles down. That's nothing. If you go down the Mariana Trench in the Pacific, that's the deepest part. Challenge is deep. That's six miles down. And a few people have been down there, including Jane Cameron of all people, um, in his own home-built sub that actually worked this time. 
and you can bet some of the people. But he did it right. That's six miles down. So the weight of the water, you are, I don't know what, how many tons it is, but two miles down, I think you're talking about two and a half tons per square inch per square inch. Very down here. Heck knows what that is. And there's a location there. And this is what the oceans currently has, the given zones. And of course, on your, these will be your um, abyssal plains. You even the shark can get down here. You've got clams, hydrothermal vents, and they're covered in two worms, crabs, sightless shrimp, sightless crabs like that. And they're all white, there's no colouring, because there's no white down there. So they don't need colouring. You just need sensors. So we've got no eyes, and they're all albino. Loads of them. That's the water cycle. Now, I was given this before I started the talk. And, ah, nice fresh couple of glasses of water. Yeah, come out the tap today. Fine, fair enough, it's all right, lovely. That water's always been here. All the water that the Earth has got has always been here. It just gets recycled through the water cycle. Evaporates off the sea, form, forms clouds, water vapor forms clouds, rains, rivers and, and uh, streams, all the sediments and nutrients back into the ocean. Interesting thing is, if I take a sip of this, which I will do in a minute, um, I'm drinking recycled water. There is a statistical pro probability that a molecule or an atom of this water was drunk by Albert Einstein. They won't, they won't, they won't increase my IQ one I enter. But a T Rex could have drank this 66 million years ago. So all the water that the Earth has, has had is always had it. We've not lost it. There's tons of water vapor in the atmosphere. It's all around us. The Earth has had the same amount of water it's had for the last 3.8 billion years. So next time you have a glass of water, think, I wonder if Julius Caesar would drink this before I mm -hmm. Just interesting thought. Hmm. Is there Isaac Newton in there? Now, um, not to frighten anybody, <laughs> This is a map of the epicenters of volcanoes from 1963 to 1998. You see a pattern emerging here? They're going along plate boundaries. Look at Africa. Ever heard of the Rift Valley? Africa's split apart. Another five to ten million years. There's going to be a new sea there. It's ripped in the heart. I'll do this quick because we've got to get to the new roots of life yet. Earthquakes. Those are wonderful things. <coughs> that is the epicenter of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, which killed, I think, about 17,000 people. That's what slipped. The San Andreas fault is a strike slip. So there's one plane rubbing against another. And it goes so far and it locks, the pressure builds up, and then it just snaps. <coughs> That's what it can do. The bottom picture are fires. Earthquakes don't cause fires. No, they don't, but they can rupture gas lines. So there's secondary effects to earthquakes. It's not just the shaking. This is a recent one. Turkey Syria earthquake of February this year. <coughs> and it was that fault oh, that slipped. And that produced a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. And he did that. Mainly because the buildings weren't up to snow. 
weren't up to code. They weren't built to earthquake resistance codes. Okay now. That's Mauna Kea. Uh, you can see it from the top of Mauna Kea. You can see some white buildings. They're auxiliary. There's a shield volcano in Iceland, which I'm not going to pronounce because I can't be right on it. This is where shield volcanoes get the name from, Viking Shield. You can see where we get the name from. Shield volcanoes are the shape they are because the lava they emit hasn't got much silver dioxide in it or silica. So it's running them. So gravity tends to go down you go. It makes a shield. There's a cone, silver cone in Russia. That's a strato volcano. Now we get to the more idea what a volcano is like. These are the ones that can go bang, and go pop. There's various parts of it. The one, main ones you need, need, need to keep an eye on is the last chamber, the magma chamber, the conduit, basically the frozen bit, and some of the outer layers. These are the ones that can pressurise and go bang. Absolutely, there's lovely chemicals that can come out of the volcanic eruption. Silicon dioxide, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, hydrochloric acid, uh, hydrogen chloride, mixes of atmosphere, get other chemicals. Lovely. Lovely. In fact, now Pinatubo has popped in, popped in its top in 1991. That chucked out so much sulfur dioxide it caused an episode of. Or better with a global dimming. It changes the temperature by half a degree globally for the next 18 months, if memory serves. That's just one volcanic event. Mount Vesuvius, which is like a small piece of the moon, a bit of the This is the one that did for Pompeii. Now, people say, why do people build cities in these places and why do they build them around volcanoes? Well, volcanoes, when they erupt, all the eruptive um, material produce the best growing land. Particularly if you're into wine and the grapes, you get some decent wine. <laughs> That's why I have cities around there. So there's the the city there, there's the port, there's the Bay of Naples. In AD 79, August, Vesuvius went pop and it threw up an ash cloud, a pyroclastic cloud. It's ash, rock, and gas. And when I say rock, I don't mean anything that size, anything that size of that table or larger. Volcanic bombs, you do not want to be under there. A pyroclastic flow can move, once it goes down in the flanks of a volcano, can move at 150 miles an hour. You can't outrun it. Unlike very viscous lava, like out of um, you can go, oh, lava, oh, help. Just step out of the way. This stuff, you can't. You're dead. As soon as you see it, you are suffocated, suffocated, roasted, and beaten to a pulp all at the same time. Don't try and breathe it. Either. It's coarse um, particles, they're called shredded lung on the inside. The lungs will fill up the fluid, you'll basically drown in your own blood. But to make things even worse, if it can get any worse, that part of pyroclastic material will set in your lungs like concrete because it's mixed with fluids. Not a very nice way to go. So when this went off, it threw all this material in the air and gravity went, not going to stay down there long, it up there, long right, Boom, it collapsed. And that's when it went straight for Pompeii, Herculaneum, by the way, the main Pompeii. 
they were trying to evacuate evacuate people across the Gulf of Salerno, but people on the beach were starting to get killed because all this stuff was coming out of them. That's Pompeii as it looks now, with the series in the background. And they're the victims. These are casts of the bodies. Um, someone got some plaster and filled in the holes where the bodies used to be and they formed these casts. And you see this fellow here. He's up on one arm. He's either trying to get up or he's trying to breathe. The rest, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a child here. That is a painting by Jersey Bright on the series. Now, this is a bit of artistic license. When he was going to Italy, between 1774 and 1776, the series didn't erupt. He thought, oh, I'll paint it anyway. The last time the series erupted was in 1944, while the Second World War was going on. It hasn't erupted since. Mount St. Helens. Ooh, I'm going to go to this one. Mount St. Helens, back in 1980. That's how it looked pre eruption. The bottom one, the northern flank, was pushing out. The mountain chain was pressurizing. It's going to boil. And it blew on the 18th of May, 1980. And that's how it blew. The whole northern flank of the volcano just slid out. What's known as a lateral blast. And then the whole thing was inverted to gold. And that's the dome. As of 2006, and it's still active. There's every so often there's a little earthquake saying, "Yeah, I'm, I'm still awake." There's all the spreading centres associated with the volcano. This, the Pacific Plate, has got the wonderful nickname of the Ring of Fire. I wonder why. There's Japan. Ouch. Earthquake and volcano city. In fact, I think Japan sits across two or three plate boundaries. Hawaii, hotspots. There's like mantle plume coming up. And as the plate, the tectonic plate moves, you get um, volcano after volcano after the volcano. And it produces a chain of what's known as sea mounts. These things. There's the main island of Hawaii. There are the sea mounts. This has been gone for the past 50 million years. And these are some hotspot locations. Boom. Everyone's watching this one. Yellowstone National Park. That's been categorized as a <coughs> super volcano. No, it doesn't wear a cape, it has a big S on its front. This is a large one. The caldera for this the crater is 60 miles across. The park sits in that. There's a lake in the park. That's moved in the last 20, 30 years because the ground is uplifting because the magma chamber is filling up. So as the ground bulges, the water's going, oh, hey, up, off we go. It's moving. Keep your eye on that one. If that goes, go on now, I think, because that's going to not be known for any other What's that? Do you have hot, hot spot volcanism somewhere else? Yes, you do. This is Mars. Olympus Mars, the largest volcano in the solar system. The cliffs here, at the bottom, they're a mile high. A mile high. And there's the Tharsis range. And the whole part, part of that was the planet is uplifted. Further away from that, ah, you can see it there, Barrena Valley. The Grand Canyon will probably fit in a little bit there. And because it crossed the extension, it caused the crust to break open and it's formed Barrena Valley. That's Matt Mons on Venus. Also, from hot, hot spot volcanism. They now reckon, in a paper read recently, they now reckon that 
Venus has probably got 85,000 volcanoes on its surface. Whether they're still active or not remains to be seen. I mean, this, this, was, this is often radar data because you can't see through the clouds of Venus, so they use radar to get a view of the surface. And also some of the data and some of the radar returns have changed. So there was some volcanoes. Really scary, yeah? This is Toba, a supervolcano from Sumatra. That kicked off 74,000 years ago. That very nearly killed us off. Genetically, you can look at the genetic markers, you'll notice there's a bottom there. There's loads of humans. And then round about this time, 70,000 years ago, there's a bottom there. What's all that? You extrapolate that data, and it seems to fit with this eruption. But if this right, if this, if this is right, Toba reduced the human population at that time to 10,000 individuals. And then we re-radiated out. So technically, we're all more closely related than we think. Hey, of course. <laughs> on, on a genetic level. Now, I'm going to rush through this because it's quite percent. We're now back. That's how the Earth works now. This is how we get there. This is the Hidean, 4.5 billion years ago. Earth has formed. Fish have gone. Hello! There's the moon. See how close it is? Who would want to go for a Sunday walk in there? Not, very, not a very hospitable place. There you are. There's the area. That's the atmosphere at the time. This is the current atmosphere. That's the atmosphere during the Hadean. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, hydrogen, nitrogen, and CO2. Ooh. When are we going to be breathing now? Okay, fine, what's the significance of that? Well, there was two scientists at the time. J.B.S. Haldai, English evolutionary biologist, and Alexander Ivanovich Popovin, Soviet biochemist, looked at the early atmosphere and went, yeah, from a biochemical standpoint, you couldn't make an amino acid out of this. Had it, that's before DNA was formed. They knew about amino acids, but they didn't know how to do that. on the paper, wrote it up. Yeah. Then in the 50s, oh, by the way, go back pale blue dot. Here's the pale orange dot of the Hidden. Um, two other scientists in the 1950s, Harry Holden Gure and Stanley Miller, went, right, I'll get this test tube here, put some water vapour in there, Put an electric charge through there, put all the gases in there, put a condenser in there, pour the, pour the water there for here, put some electrodes in because it's lightning there. Bang! Ran it for two weeks. After two weeks, the inside of the reaction vessel started to turn light brown. They looked at the uh, sampling probe, the water in there. And lo and behold, they found amino acids. And they went, it's a very bit hard day, and they were Okay, fine, lovely. We know where they come from. Yes and no. Meteorites have since been found to contain amino acids, like Alende. I dearly hope my sample here has got some amino acids by the afternoon. Meteorites like that have got amino acids. And that's here's a lend day. Close up. Not this one, somebody else was saying. So carbonation meteorite is chock full of carbon and it's chock full of amino acids. It's the building blocks of DNA. There's another one, Murchison, landed in 1969, in fact same year as uh, Lende. That's chock full of amino acids as well. Comets, comets have got them as well. 
That's glycine, one of the amino acids used, used in DNA. That was found in a molecular cloud by a radio telescope. National Radio Astronomy Observatory in 2003. So we know this can be made in interstellar space as well. It's just drifting out there. Chances are there's amino acids in the solar nebula. So it's not just the action of lightning in the early atmosphere that produced the building blocks of life. There's our friend DNA. But that wasn't the first one. The first one was RNA. And it had the it had one different letter, uracil, rather than thymine. That was the DNA of its time. Then the double helix came along, came along and went, no, I can do a better job, I can put far more information. Okay, fine. I'll, be, I'll become an information runner for you. Oh, all right then. So this transmitted the information onto the DNA saying you need to do this. That is the early development of life. It's a bit scrappy. Um, we're, not, we're not sure about a, a lot of this process because it doesn't cross our eyes. Particularly this bit. How do you get from simple cells with DNA to complex life? And more importantly, Luca. And it's not a pop song, no. Luca stands for the last, last universal common ancestor. That's the organism that everything is related to. Say hello to your great, 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 great. grandfather, grandmother, whatever. That's the tree of life. There's the animals, the archaea bacteria, the cyanobacteria. I'll tell you this quickly. That is a black smoker, hydrothermal vent. This is where the thing life began. All the um, amino acids from there uh, started forming these cells. And that's the timeline. Now, at the moment, you've hardly started the journey, but you've got the building blocks of life. But now, let's take a closer look at the environment that sets through the work. A simple chemical circumstance led to one of the great moments in the history of our planet. There were many kinds of molecules in the primordial soup. Some were attracted to water on one side and repelled by it on the other. This drove them together into a tiny enclosed spherical shell, like a soap bubble, which protected the interior. Within the bubble, the ancestors of DNA found a home and the first cell arose. It took hundreds of millions of years for tiny plants to evolve. So you that bridge plant didn't lead to us. Bacteria that could breathe oxygen took over a billion more years to evolve. From a naked nucleus, a cell developed with a nucleus inside. Some of these amoeba-like forms led eventually to plants. Others produced colonies with inside and outside cells performing different functions. Thank you. 
be swimming in Oxford, something like a bath. ancestors now, 500 million years ago, were jawless, filter-eating fish, a little like lampreys. Gradually, those tiny fish evolved, eyes and jaws. Fish then began to eat one another. If you could swim fast, you survived. If you had jaws to eat with, you could now use your gills to breathe the oxygen in the water. This is the way modern fish arose. During the summer, some swamps and lakes dried up, so some fish evolved a primitive lung to breathe air until the rains came. Their brains were getting bigger. If the rains didn't come, it was handy to be able to pull yourself along to the next swamp. That was a very important adaptation. First amphibians evolved still with a fish-like tail. Amphibians, like fish, laid their eggs in water where they were easily eaten. But then a splendid new invention came along, a hard-shelled egg laid on the land where there were as yet no predators. Reptiles and turtles go back to those days. Many of the reptiles hatched on land never returned to the waters. Some became the dinosaurs. One line of dinosaurs developed feathers useful for short flights. Today, the only living descendants of the dinosaurs are the birds. The great dinosaurs evolved along another branch. Some were the largest flesh eaters ever to walk the land. But 65 million years ago, they all mysteriously perished. Meanwhile, the forerunners of the dinosaurs were also evolving in a different direction. Small, scurrying creatures young growing inside the mother's body. After the extinction of the dinosaurs, many different forms developed. The young were very immature at birth, in the marsupials, the wombat, for example, and in the mammals. The young had to be taught how to survive. The brain grew larger still. Something like a shrew was the ancestor of all the mammals. curiosity about their environment. Some became baboons, but that's not the line to us. Apes and humans have a recent common ancestor. Bone for bone, muscle for muscle, molecule for molecule. There are almost no important differences between apes and humans. Unlike the chimpanzee, our ancestors walked upright, freeing their hands to and experiment. We got smart. We began to talk. Many collateral branches of the human family became extinct in the last few million years. We, with our brains in our hands, are the survivors. There's an unbroken thread that stretches from those first cells to us. Let's look at it again. Compressing four billion years of evolution. Not this time. <laughs> so, I'll go through these clips I am marking the time. That's what we're going through with this. We're now in the Archean, four billion years ago. It's still not exactly scared at the moment. It's still a noxious atmosphere, there's volcanoes going off all over the place, but there's a difference. Life started to emerge, and there's cyan called cyanobacteria. And they built colonies. Here, yeah, of course, macrolides, which you'll see. Oh, hey, oh. What are you doing? Don't do that. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Thank you. Dare. Thank you. How the Earth looked. The first continent, Valbara, was there. I think part of that now forms part of 
South America or South Africa? And we're still getting hit. Now, we're getting into the late heavy bombardment. Now we get to see why the moon looks the way it does. Uranus and Neptune swap places. It's on, on the moon. Neptune was inside the orbit of Uranus. It moved and swapped. As it did that, Neptune swept outwards, smacked straight into the Kuiper belt. Icy bodies, bits of rock, the whole thing. Rubbish all over the place. In a solar system went, oh no. Bang. Earth got hit, moon got hit. All these areas, the lunar seas, these are known as flood basalt areas. Basically, asteroids come in, come bang, rupture the surface, magma's come out, and resurface that. This is a young surface, this is old crater surface. This is about 3.8 billion years old. And there's one new fact, mere embryo, the sea of rains. That was caused by an asteroid. Here's an off in the cyanobacteria. These are hardy little so and so. These are around to this day. This is a modern day. But they didn't do themselves many favours, you'll find out in a minute. Fossil stromatolites from the Yeshua complex in green. These are 3.8 billion years old. This is Shark Bay in Australia. Stromatolites, there. The outer, the, the outer surface is alive, it's like a bacterial mat. And as each colony dies off, it leaves, leaves its remains behind, so it forms these domes. The four main events in the Great oxidation event, 30 eukaryotes, snowball earth, and, and uh, Indicarian fossils, which is that one, earliest one to say that one. The first great dying, or I'm calling it anyway, there's been five extinction events. End order vision, that killed 70% of species, late Devonian killed 70%, end Permian, that took out 96% of all species on Earth. That really did for us. End Triassic, that got rid of 75%, and the end Cretaceous, which you'll see later with the Great Big Rock, took out 50% of all species. Uh, many observers say we're going through a sixth extinction event, and it did some humans are to blame. I don't particularly buy that yet. The, 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 the jury is still out on that. The first one, or oh, I'm saying the first one, is the Great Oxidation event. And it goes back to our friends, the cyanobacteria. They photosynthesize. They take in carbon dioxide, use that and sunlight to create sugars, so from there. And they <coughs> pass oxygen as a waste product. Yeah. They got pretty good at this. You've got your somatolites, you've got cyanobacteria floating in the atmosphere, you've got cyanobacteria in the sea. Second voice, the voice of carbon dioxide. Yum, 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 yum. The seas were a nice greeny blue. And then, when they got all this oxygen out, the iron in solution in the waters, when there's oxygen here, oxygen went, ha ha ha! What do you get? Iron, iron oxygen, rust, banded iron formation. The seas turned blood red. The cyanobacteria went, we just poisoned ourselves or our waste product. Too much oxygen. Started to die off. Also, temperatures dropped because not enough CO2 and other greenhouse gases there, even though there wasn't that much. There's more oxygen, dropped temperatures, so they need to snow the whole earth. This is the first Ediacaran fossil, Sprigina. Basically a worm, soft bodied. That's the first one. You're talking, 
535 million years ago. We're just out of the halfway. <laughs> Can we get one nine o'clock? We'll find out. We're halfway. You might think, oh, that's a, that's a stretch. Yeah, you haven't even started. Another unicorn in the bottom. That's Billy. Tiny, about, about a millimetre. It looked like a, a jellyfish without the fronds. They just stayed on the ocean bottom. Charnier. Right. Plant or animal? Charmwood Forest um, uh, uh, rocks in Leicestershire by a 15 year old schoolboy in, in the 1950s. This is about 600 million years, years old, roughly, give or take. And it just stood, it just anchored itself to the ocean floor and it just bottomed around and it absorbed its particles of the water. It didn't move. <coughs> so these are the areas we're going to go through and we're going to go through them quickly. The one with the biggest load is the Paleozoic. You've got the Cambrian, which you're going to see in a minute, or the Vision, Silurian, Devonian, Car Carbonian, and some per Permian. We are currently in the Cenozoic. That's the Paleogene, Neogene, Quaternion. The Quaternion is where we turn off. So we're at the bottom. That's what happened during the Paleozoic. You got Carboniferous, Devonian, it's a top row. Uh, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian. Next row. Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, wrote to that Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. Next one, Paleogene, Neogene, Quaternary. I don't think I would have liked to have been around during the Silurian. That's a sea scorpion. You wait till you get to the um, Carboniferous, you'll see some scorpions there. That's how the Earth's landmass has looked. Not very recognisable. Now we get to the Cambrian. Now things really heat up. It's like nature's gone, right, I've got these basic ideas. Let's go absolutely wild. Let's design everything I can. Nature went crackers. These are shale beds in Canada. Walcock, Walcock, Quarry. Basically part of a, what's known as a turbidite, a mudslide in an ancient sea. And there's all these organism and they just got covered. And they were soft bodied as well. All the virgin cells are soft, what soft bodied. You get things like that. Who's Magina? The name is appropriate, I think. <laughs> um, they looked at this and went, hang on a minute. For years, that's how they thought it was. So these funny strange bits they funny. To, to, to feed, and it walks on these. Recent, since I'm turning around, say, you've got that upside down. The spines are for defense, <laughs> they're not means of locomotion. It's a way to ward off predators. But for the last 25, 30 years, probably 40 years, we thought that was the right way. But no, you got it upside down. Morella Splendent, sort of related to the trilobites. This one's called a babina. And that's his mouth at the end of a tube. It grabbers. It was a, it stuck its, want a better word, proboscis into the mud to get after other creatures. So it's basically like, like a, a hoover. Say hello to your great 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 ancestor. This is called Bakaya. It's only tiny bat, two centimeters long. Tiny thing. 
This was the first chordate. Not a backbone, it wasn't a vertebrate. It's the first one to have a spinal cord, a nervous system. That's on the line to us. So, that's a relative. They're not. Fibroids. They just boggled around the, the um, ocean floor feeding. They went from 535 million years to 66 million years when the chips were in fact happened. The order vision. Still no recognizable contents, but thanks for pay tectonics, things are moving. That was no more than that Pangaea. There was a southern continent. There's a depiction of all the vision, mainly marine again. This strange looking thing, this squid like thing is Orphoceros. That was one of the main predators at the time. You may think these bones. There's a crinoid in there, you think, oh, oh, look, these bones. No, these are all animals. The filter feeders just sit there, you know, any particles coming past. That's all they do. And that is a fossiliferous limestone trap, and it's full of crinoids. I think it's a couple of brachiopods in there. <laughs> and now we get to the sea scorpions. Um, these are only tiny ones, but later on, the later Eurocterids, they got to about two, two meters in length. I wouldn't want to go swimming while they were. Now, there was an extinction event at the end of the world vision. Basically, the atmospheric carbon dioxide level fell from 7,000 parts per million. At the moment, people are going, oh, is it 420 parts per million going to be dying? That was 7,000 parts per million during the world vision. And it reduced to 4,400. The difficulty of quake was by active, the volcanic activity was what is the new silicate rocks which drew out CO2. Basically, it changed the carbon dioxide concentrations and changed the carbon dioxide concentrations in the seas as well. This was mainly, because there's only marine organisms around, this was a marine collapse. It changed, to a certain degree, the acidity of the water as well. So if you got carbon, carbon, capturing carbon in shell, that you've been growing all your life, this happens, oh, the earth turns a bit acidic. Oh dear, that doesn't show. You're dead. That's happened on a few a few times. Then there's the glaciations, not the temperature down as well. Because that's CO2 in the atmosphere, it's got cold. That's the Silurian, 440 million years ago. Still nothing recognisable. Silurian, Silurian mm, it was a greenhouse phase supported by high CO2 levels of 4,500 parts per million. The warm shallow seas and ecosystem land masses, life was still marine. There was nothing on the land. Not even plants at this point. There's plenty of cyanobacteria. They were, that was all over the place, but maybe in the coast. There's your first plant, Coxonia, the first vascular plant, the first plant to have veins on it, basically. So it could transport nutrients and water around the plant so it could grow. That's your first plant. There's a crinoid, not a plant, an animal. Modern crinoids are still around today. That is a pachyderm, Entelogynathus. Pachyderm basically is armoured fish. Its head has got armoured plates. It's got an armoured jaw. This is a development. If you're getting confused the way I'm rushing about it, I apologise. Um, you see it's unrecognisable. They've gone, that's gone, gone one. 
Es un buen pegue. En el medio de la vida. Por lo cual, no hay más cobre en el medio de la vida. Cobre va a 5 degrees. Again, changing the CO2. There's no shock horror. There's no humans around to change it. It's a natural cycle. There was reformed organisms during the war periods. Corals. They died off a bit as the CO2 concentration went down and the ocean temperatures changed. We've got plants now. Well, technically, no. That is prototaxis, or taxites, these things. Do they know what they are? Oh, no. What sort of say tree? I'm just itching to say. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I fell for it. No, they're not trees. They're not trees. It's a giant fungus. These are about 24 feet tall. There is a dauntless this. Another plant here. The fish are getting bigger. And they're getting more predatory. Now, yeah, okay, fine. I won't break. These are your brachiopods. I've got a brachiopod down there. These again, just stay there in the filter feed. Oh, surprise, surprise, there's another, there's another extinction. Now, this is estimated 96% of vertebrates and bony fishes, it's common kind of and bony fishes, went during this. But here's the strange thing. The reason for that extinction is still unknown. All theories are on the table. There's no one lead. Somebody has, has suggested, uh, Canadian paleontologist Digman, Digman King said um, impacts in Lake Devonian. Yes, there were, but the geological record doesn't say that we're big enough to cause that kind of extinction event. At the moment, we don't know what happened. There's the Carboniferous. Now things really ramp up. Anyone got a coal fire? Oh, yeah. Well, there's a source of your coal. <laughs> it's in the Carboniferous. Or your Carboniferous forests. This is where things life really took off. And I don't think I would have liked the Carboniferous because you're going to get some very big arthropods and invertebrates. Big spiders, big millipedes, and big dragonflies. And I don't like spiders. I run away screaming like a girl from the mum's <laughs> I wouldn't have lasted two seconds here. Because the oxygen went up to 35% in the atmosphere. Now, um, insects don't breathe the way we do, they breathe through lots of it spiracles, what you call it? It's sort of directly absorbed through into air sacs. The more oxygen you get, the more spiracles you get, the bigger you get. So the oxygen level but I've read a paper recently that's starting to, to, to dispute that, so don't quote me. So, carbon dioxide fell, fell roughly eight times the current level, and oxygen went up. And this is what you get. Now, we've got trees. Lycopods. In fact, if I, if I pass this around, it's only a cast, no, I'm not going to put it that is a lycopod tree root from the Carboniferous. All your coal and oil was laid down during this period. If anyone says to you, oh, oil, oh, we're using dead, dead dinosaurs. No, the oil came from the plants as well. The amount of oil was contributed by dead dinosaurs, hmm, it's all plants. And one says, you're putting, you're putting a dinosaur in your car. No, no, I'm putting a tree in. There's all plant material. And that's a tree trunk from a black pod tree. Or black opposite. 
That is a dragonfly. A big one, Meganora. 28 inches across. I'm not swatting that. That's a scorpion. 28 inches. I really don't want to be in the Carboniferous. That's Arthroplora, a millipede. All eight foot two inches of it. Anybody want to go in a time machine and go to the Carboniferous? Because I ain't going. This is Pedipedes, a amphibian, the first two amphibian. Pedipedes means Peter's foot. Now, who, who Peter is or what his foot's doing now, I'll never know. Um, but this is the first amphibian, and now the land occupation by land organisms starts. Petrochosaurus, a reptile, who might have called it first. There is an early shark. I don't know if you realise, but it's got an iron board strapped to his head. We don't know what that's for, whether it's for display, for mating purposes, or whether it's a, a weapon of some kind, I don't know. But we don't know why it has that. And these have like cartridges, like proper um, traps with one of these little steps. On to Prime, another early um, shark. Yeah. That's its teeth. It's like a buzzsaw. When it does, it casts anything, it sort of has to rub its teeth against its weight to break it down. Strange design. Here's the Permian. <laughs> now we can see that. That is. Pangaea again, three or four, and you see there's mountains building up. You see deserts as well. Well, what's causing that? If you've got mountain ranges, yeah, you get that. Water comes up, condenses, tries to rain. But it's raining on the windward side. The leeward side, because of the mountains in the way, causes a rain shadow. No moisture can get over the mountain range. So therefore, desert. And we're firm in deserts. There's a beetle. Probably not far. It's only about maybe a couple of, couple of centimetres. I'm not even going to pronounce that. That's an only spoon gliding reptile. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. <laughs> that is Tito Phonius. Reading on that. Oh, yeah. Both are reptiles. That can't, that's carnivorous, obviously. This is the extinction event, the Permian. This was back. This was, this was 96% of all life on Earth, land and marine. And it's volcanic what's known as the flood basalts of the Serbian tracks. This bit here. Seven million square kilometers. And this was opened up, wham. And I think it went on for five million years, I On and off. And it was a long, slow, drawn out day. Changed the um, composition of the atmosphere, messed around with plants, caused huge devastation of the marine environment because it put nasties like carbon dioxide in the water again, you've got acidic conditions, so if you've got shells, you're going to die. Not good. And also changed the oxygen levels in, in, in the water as well. By the Triassic, things have started breaking up again. Now, all the land masses together concentrated in the um, it's a dry period, and not a great deal went on. CO2 levels um, stabilised. Life went okay. I'll carry on. And this is what it, this, is, this is what happened in the two hundred thirty million years ago. There's Antarctica, attached to India. Australia is there. South America is there. North America is there. Europe. There's the Europe mountains. There's Asia. All over the place. South China's off that way. 
we're starting to see the pattern. That is an amphibian in the Triassic period. I can't remember how big it is. That is Postosuchus predator. Next to a human. Wouldn't want one for a pet. And now we see some other um, relatives. The Lystrosaur and the Slamidon. Sygonathius. These are sort of on the line in tools, more so the Slamidon than the Lystrosaur. These are like the fittiest ones, are almost like proto mammals. They were reptiles, but that was more, more of a pro proto mammal. Mesozoic Tritic extinction. We oh, can't keep away from that. Um, land uh, ecosystems suffered. Some of the early primitive stack dinosaurs did make it out. And it probably coincided with, with a global cooling event. And also an impact in the Manicurian area in. Now, I'm not saying that's smoking gun. This is all climatic again. This is changes in CO2, oxygen levels, temperature variations, plant growth because of that. So, if you heard the wars died, you can't go because they can't make a chest in the herbivores. Acid Jurassic. You're starting to see familiar features starting. This is about 201 million years ago. The climate was warmer, which the dinosaurs like because they're cold blooded. Uh, forests were nearly everywhere, even at the poles. That's why you can find um, broadleaf uh, fossils in Antarctica. But there were periods of cooling. And the plants went wild. These are ferns, Jurassic ferns. They're also like trees. It's basically, I won't say a global forest, but close to. And that's a uh, species of seed fern in the middle of Jurassic, New Yorkshire. These are bellamites, squid like things. Um, I forgot to bring the sample. I've got a a rostrum from one of these. This is the back end, this bit here. It's about that big. Looks like a spear. That's the bit that, that's the only bit that fossilizes. This is made of soft body. If you imagine a cuckoo fish and you stretch it and you put a broomstick and it's some damn shine, that's a bell one. That is not archaeopteryx. We say about our statements about the birds. Dinosaur bird chasing his lunch. Here you got your dinosaurs, a Brachiosaurus, which we used to call Brontosaurus when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Not anymore than the Brachiosaurus or sauropods, like Diplodocus down here. These are your big boys. These are the ones that weigh tens of tons. These ones are. These are ones from the Jurassic Park goes. Let's be honest. Now things are moving on. Here's the Cretaceous. 145 billion years ago. Can you see a new familiar continent starting to appear? You notice South America split from Africa. The Texas Sea is starting to close off. I don't believe that bit. Uh, warm phase, dry phase, wet phase, cold phase. Again, variations in climate based on forcing factors. <clears throat> the Jurassic is known for its, sorry, Cretaceous is known for its chalk. Waxes the dome are made out of these, coccoliths. This is an electron micrograph, micrograph. 
you talk in microsoft if that imagine the amount of organisms to create that you're talking in billions if not trillions and that was in a warm shallow sea anyone who likes fish and sharks anyone who's seen jaws if you like the top picture that is Cretophilithia, a shark, and it's jumping out of the water and it's attacking the pterosaur, one of the largest flying dinosaurs. Are. Complete artistic license. We don't know that it won't go on. Well. The other one is Titanosaurus, also from late, late uh, Cretaceous. Wouldn't want to meet him on a dark night. He looks, he looks evil. Here we go now. Anyone seen Jurassic Park? Anyone seen the Velociraptors from Jurassic Park? Did they look like that? Ah, because of the wrong. Recently, we've found, I mean, we've still got these daca-like talons. Recent um, research has suggested, and they've found fossil evidence for this, Velociraptor had feathers. And it turns out quite a few of the dinosaurs have feathers as well. So Jurassic Park got it wrong. But that's what I about, that's what I like about science. It changes all the time. Do you think, ah, yeah, it's that. 10 or 15 years down the line, 20 years down the line, oh, you've got feathers, I never knew that. There's Triceratops and Tyrannosaurus. They all around having a real good time and then <laughs> Oh dear. Oh darling, what a beautiful shooting star. Let's make a wish. Chicks will happen. 66 million years ago, there was an impact. That is a seismic survey. All these white spots are areas where they drilled for oil originally and they found what's known as shot quartz. Shot quartz. It's not quartz paint, is it? Like that. No, it's shot because it's got um, shot vapors running through it. That's the extent of the crater. These bits here are called cenotes, they're sinkholes, from the margin of the actual impact structure. That's the Cretaceous, now in my day it was called Cretaceous tertiary, now they took calling it Cretaceous paleogene. That bit there. There's an ashway in there, and it's chock full of iridium. Iridium is at the Earth core, but the Earth's crust hasn't gone all full of iridium. You know what's got iridium inside it? Asteroids. And comets. And this is based on the work of Louis Alvarez, a physicist, and his son, Walter, who was a geologist. They came up with this, and this is the shock ports. As the shock wave went through, it literally shook the ports and put the shock um, features in. Dead giveaway of an impact. There you go. <laughs> you can't say any better than that. <laughs> but, to be contrarian, at the same time, there was our, our old friend flood basalt eruptions in the Deccan area of India. By start, India was moving towards China to collide to form the heavenly lights. It hadn't got there yet, but it went over a mantle group, and that's what caused the Deccan traps. That went on for 500,000 years. Chucked an awful lot of um, basalt lava, gases on that sort of By the time Chicks Club came along, most life on Earth, including the mammals, were under stress because of this. It's pure blind luck the chips will happen when it did. Now there's an argument. There's two camps. No, it was a no, it was a meteorite. No, 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 it was a volcanic. I've got a foot in both camps. Astronomy, geology, and climate. I think they both happen because they happen really close together. I won't say you can't distinguish them, but they're really close together. There's the deck and traps. There. See the extent of it. That killed about 50% of species. We get to pay the genes. Oh, look! 
It's looking like Earth. This is 66 years, 60 million years ago. This was basically a consolidation where temperatures fluctuated again. The Atlantic Ocean was spreading. Um, North America, South America was connected by the Isthmus of Panama, Nakshane's Ocean Coast. As well. This is the Near Gene, 23 million years ago. We're nearly home. He says, oh, there's the Tethys Sea. Can you just see the Mediterranean coming up? And the Strait of Gibraltar all over there. There was still a land bridge that was just gone between Europe and uh, the UK. I think, I think I've been there this time. Um, this is Mars. Sort of cooling more than anything else now. The CO2 levels were stabilizing. There's a warm period in the middle Pliocene. Then that went into the current ice age. Now, when we say current ice age, we're still in an ice age. But we're in interglacial. So you get one ice age, but there's a series of interglaciers in that ice age. Even though the ice age finished 12,000 years ago, we're still in the ice age. We're in the interglacial, we're in the interval between two periods. Primates started coming up, like our cousin, the ring-tailed lemur. The quaternary, we're home, we're nearly there. 2.5 million years ago. Uh, climate there's a period of glaciations, continental glaciers, and there's polar poles. There's permanent ice at both poles now. Now, Antarctica is completely isolated from the rest of the continental masses, so it's got permanent um, ice. During the Quaternary Ice Age, um, yeah, Quaternary about 2.5 million years ago, that's when it started, the Quaternary Ice Age, and it's still going. To this present day. So if anyone says to you, oh, we're in trouble, you say, no you're not, we're in an ice age, what's the matter with you? What are you doing? Now, the ice was so much ice. In fact, I think the ice was about a mile thick in some places. And it weighed the land masses down. So when the ice um, retreated, the um, land masses sprang back up, which again dropped the sea level a bit because the land went up. So it dropped the sea level. Now you think, all that ice melting or right, the raise the sea level. It did, but with the rebound, it sort of cancelled it out. It just showed you how much weight these glaciers had. Mm -hmm. And it's around this time, actually about seven million years ago, our sort of directest ancestor, Australopithecus, Australopithecus afarensis, came about. Still ate by a big chimpanzee, but it had an opposable thumb. It can do things, it can grab things, it can touch things, it can make things. Have you ever seen a chimpanzee get termites out of the termite man with a stick? Fascinating. You get it. Just a stick from the ground, got leaves on it, I'll get a little of it, use his hand, strip the leaves, hold it like that, puts the stick in the hole, bag -bag 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 -bag. termites attack the stick, oh my god. Now, how it thought to do that to begin with, and was it taught by its forebears as well, but it's got the mechanical wherewithal to hold a stick like that, because before, the thumb was out here. You can only do that. Ooh, that hurts. Um, but now we've got a pleasurable thumb, we can do that. So we can make tools. Just a quick one.
This is the family tree, the funeral tree, from the Miocene to the Pleistocene, heading towards the Holocene. There's Homo sapiens, us, 200,000 years, new kids on the block. We were neighbours with the Neanderthals. In fact, I think I think I think it's still another thing. But anyway, um, we outcompeted them. But not only that, we also bred with them as well. So we bred them out as the genetic record. But genetically, somewhere in here, there's a Neanderthal. Only people said that to me in the past, but I don't know. <laughs> but somewhere in there, there's an ancestral Neanderthal DNA. So, the future. What kind of magnificent future has life got? Do you want me to lie? I'm going to tell you the truth. Six billion years from now, our sun will change the way it operates. It will go from burning hydrogen to helium. And to do that, it's got to reorganise its internal structure. So it's going to expand out and form us as a red giant. That's it, as a red giant. That's the sun as it is now. Mercury will be engulfed. Venus will be engulfed. Earth certainly will. Mars, probably that might get a bit scorched. Jupiter might get a bit sick. That's what's going to happen to the Earth before it gets engulfed. A dead, scorched Earth orbiting the red giant sun. What a happy talk. Um, but don't worry, six billion years in the future, don't worry about it. After that, the sun will rearrange itself and it will throw out its outer layers and become a planetary nebula. And what will be left is a white dwarf star. And that will carry on shining for about 200 million years, and then that will cool off and become a black star. That is a planetary nebula, known as the Helix Nebula. That's what's going to happen to the sun. You're looking at our future, ladies and gentlemen. Feeling happy? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'll bring this to a close. I hope I've not. So I had to rush through some of this because there's not a lot in there. There's four and a half billion years of Earth's history in there in by the two hours. Yeah. I've never had so many twists and turns trying to get a lecture super chill one into one presentation. So like I said, they're still arguing about chicks and chicks, or they're still arguing, is it was it Deccan traps, was it was it the impactor? We don't know about the Devonian, oh, that dinosaur out there. Are you sure? It's still going to, that's what I like about science. It changes. It's not fixed. So if I ever come to this talk, it, talk again, <laughs> it might change again. So if I'm, if I'm not bored yet, and you're interested, I suggest you get a copy of that. That's not my copy, it might, it might be a free copy. Dig some of your geology. It's got all the geological terms in there you, you want to know. If you want any introductory texts, now, this is going back to my undergraduate days at university, so these might be a bit out of date. Get yourself something like Understanding Earth, or Dynamic Earth, or Physical Geology, or New, new Views on the Whole Planet, or Heat Earth in Israel, Certificate of Power. Generally, settlements arise. Atmosphere, weather, and climate. Understanding fossils. Now, I only did invertebrate fossils, the, the, the animal fossils at the university, all that stuff. Sort of. On the teeth and scales and the claws, I didn't do. I didn't do invertebrates. I don't know what I'm going to So, I hope I've done a good job tonight. Um, if you want to know about the beginnings of life and the virtue shells, this is a fantastic book, Wonderful What Life by the great Stephen Tate and Jay Gould. If you want a complete background of the virgin set shells and the virgin shell organisms, that's the book. 
that was published. Oh, when did I get that? In the second year of university, so that must be 23, four years old now. Even though the author's passed away, it can't be updated, it's still a good read and it gives you some idea of how the candy explosion happened. So, with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you've got any questions, ask away. Could I have a look at the samples, please, Dick?